Hi and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus. And today's video is about uh, off, does not really mean off anymore. So alrighty, uh, I made a couple videos about uh, how to make a Faraday box to keep your smartphone in and there were many comments uh, about, well why don't you just turn the thing off because if it's off then you're done, right? And the answer to that is no, not at all. So, okay, in the olden days we had mechanical switches, right? So whatever kind of gizmo you're talking about, there was a mechanical switch. And when you pressed the mechanical switch, there are contacts inside. And when you turned it on, the contacts made contact. And when you turned it off, the contacts separated. And when the contacts were connected, power was sent to the device, whether it was powered by a battery or the wall socket or whatever. In the, this glorious modern era of wonderful everything is electronic, type of technology, even things like your washing machine no longer has this kind of mechanical power switch. It's usually a momentary push button, and when you push it, you know, the display fires up and it says like, welcome to the Laundry Master 1000, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And so the reason for that is because the power switches on everything, they are now uh, electronically controlled, because everything has like a little computer chip in it nowadays. So very few things are actually ever off because there's always some part of your gizmo whether it's a computer or a smartphone or a tablet or even a washing machine uh, a blu-ray player all that kind of thing um, all of these things have some part of their of the electronics inside that has to that has to stay powered for example your smartphone how do you turn it on well usually you press and hold a momentary button on the side and after you've held the button for a couple seconds the phone fires up that's because there's a part of the phone that actually stays powered by the battery. Now it uses a very small amount of juice from the battery, so it doesn't it doesn't drain the battery totally when it's off. But again, it's basically an electronic on switch, so there's always a part of the phone that is always powered. It's never actually technically super off. And actually, this is um, this is not anything new. Um, even things like computers and all, you know, all kinds of stuff, they haven't actually been off-off for a long time. So I'm going to talk about uh, three main gizmos here where uh, off is not really off. So the first is computers, and um, there are two main ways that uh, your computer is not actually off. The first is many business class uh, laptops and desktop computers, um, for example, like the HP ProBook laptops, these are business class laptops, but as a normal consumer, of course, you can buy them. And if you go into the BIOS, which is the, the firmware that runs when you turn your computer on, well, nowadays it's called UEFI, or some I've heard people say UEFI, which to me sounds like someone barfing. So when I say BIOS, just assume I mean UEFI, because I like BIOS better. So anyway, you go into the BIOS settings, you know, the computer starts up and you press delete or F2, you get into the, the BIOS settings, and uh, the BIOS is the thing that sets up all the devices in your computer uh, before it hands control off to the operating system, whatever that is, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, whatever. And in the BIOS there are, on some computers, there's a setting where you can actually tell the computer when it's off, it will power on, say, at 6 a.m. every day, and it will power off at, say, 11 p.m. every day. Now, not all computers can do this, as I said, but many of them can. So even when the computer is in an off state, it's not actually off. It can be powered on. Uh, the second thing with computers is what they call wake on LAN, which means that, again, this is a setting. You can go into the BIOS on your computer, and you can turn this on. I think in Macs, um, I'm not sure if this is entirely true, but I read somewhere that uh, Macs typically come with wake on LAN activated by default. In many other computers, you actually have to manually go in and turn it on. But what Wake on LAN does is when the computer is off, off, then it, uh, it, it keeps power going to the Ethernet, part of the Ethernet chip on the motherboard of the computer. So that uh, when your computer is off, you can look, and if you've got an Ethernet cable plugged in, you'll still see the little LEDs flashing where the Ethernet cable plugs in, you know? And that's because the Ethernet is still partially powered, and what it's waiting for is a what they call a magic packet and I won't get into all the details of that but essentially what happens is if you send this magic packet to the computer that's off 
and if wake on LAN is enabled, you can actually remotely wake the computer up. So again, it's not really off, it's kind of off. Uh, now, usually wake on LAN is something that happens, obviously, from its name, wake on LAN, wake on local area network. It happens locally, right? But it is possible to actually configure, say, like your internet router or whatever to forward the proper packets and blah, blah, blah from the internet. So it is technically possible to make a computer wake using wake on LAN. It's possible to power it on remotely over the internet. That actually requires things like setting up things like NAT and ARP and everything on your router, um, which is not easy to do, but actually uh, home routers for internet access are actually infamously crappy and not very secure. And in fact, most people don't ever update the firmware on them. So even if the manufacturer does release firmware updates, it doesn't really matter. Even if they release a firmware update that has security fixes, most people don't actually install those things. So it's relatively trivial for a not even a very smart person to hack a router and basically set everything up and possibly turn a computer on remotely. Uh, so right, computers actually have not been off for a long time. That's been going on for years and years and years. The second thing I want to talk about is smartphones. And uh, okay, I'm going to draw a picture for this one. So for smartphones, you have, basically when you buy a smartphone, you have, uh, you'll, buy the, you'll buy the smartphone because, say, like it has like an, an octa-core processor and it's like super awesome, right? Okay, uh, that's what they call the application processor. So what you have is basically, this is your, your app processor, and this might be associated with a certain amount of RAM memory, and it's this application processor that actually runs the smart aspect of your smartphone. Uh, it runs Android or iOS, and it lets you do all kinds of stuff like WhatsApp and Facebook and all that great stuff, right? There's a second processor in every smartphone called the baseband processor. And sometimes it is associated with its own RAM, and sometimes it actually works like this, where there's the application processor the baseband processor, and they actually share RAM between the two. This is an even more interesting situation because you can do all kinds of extra evil stuff if that's the case. But in any case, this baseband processor is, it's, it's, um, it's literally like another CPU. It has its own memory. It has its own uh, real-time operating system that's apart from, say, Android running on your, the main processor. You've got your baseband, own operating system, own RAM, own uh, its its own code, its own firmware, and this this guy, the baseband processor, is actually attached to uh, the um, that's an antenna. <laughs> the baseband processor actually does all the cellular phone communication stuff. It does transmitting and receiving and encoding and and encrypting and uh, the whole reason they have these baseband processors is because this guy actually needs to be like certified by the FCC and it has to be um, you know, they, they have to get all, all this stuff passed because it's all about you know sending radio waves to and from and that, that sort of thing so in order to keep like the cost and the nonsense with with developing and, and getting a, a smartphone approved for for sale what often happens is that these baseband processors are actually that guy is actually made by one of uh, like two, three, four companies. Um, Qualcomm is a big one. Uh, Infineon, which apparently was bought by Intel or something. Um, there's a couple companies that make these baseband processors. And whereas your application processor is, say, running like Android or whatever, Android is open source, right? The baseband processor actually has, like I said, it has a real-time operating system, and the code for these baseband processors is totally proprietary. The code for baseband processors is like like it's like a better kept secret than like the plans for the original nuclear bomb like it's seriously kind of ridiculous it's not open source um no one can actually no one actually knows what the the code that makes this baseband processor go no one actually knows what they're doing it's like it's like it's kind of crazy actually so 
Okay, so why does that matter? Well, your baseband processor also has access to the microphone and speaker in your phone because it's it's involved with, uh, usually, because it's involved with talking on the phone, right? You're sitting, you're holding your phone, you're talking, and it's that baseband processor that's that's very, very efficient. Um, its timing is very important for sending and receiving cellular radio signals. So it's this baseband processor that essentially handles all the data and voice transmission, and it kind of manages all the 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 cell phone side of things. Uh, the problem is that, as I said, this code that runs these things is like very top secret, and so no one actually knows what it's doing. And um, back, it's uh, almost a decade ago. There was a guy by the name of Ralph Weinman, and he was at some hacker conference or whatever, and he he apparently discovered through uh, painstaking sort of reverse engineering that he basically basically what he did is he he was able to set up uh, a fake base station now, like a base station is usually the cell phone tower right what he did is he has this box with antennas on and he he essentially sets up this what looks like a cell phone tower to any phones in the area but it's his personal cell phone tower and when a phone connected to it he could actually um, the specific case that, that he talks about in the presentation that I'm thinking of, he, he could actually, any iPhone that connected to his fake base station, he could essentially load malware into the baseband firmware of the iPhone, and he got the iPhone to record uh, up to several hours of audio. The audio recorded was compressed, because the baseband processor can do that too, and it was also encrypted, and it would store these several hours of audio when the phone appeared to actually be off. So the, the iPhone got, you know, he hacks the phone, person turns their iPhone off, or at least they think they have, but actually they haven't, because the baseband processor is a very low-level thing, and this has nothing to do with iOS, it had nothing to do with the main processor, it's this other, this other part of the phone that he hacked. And so then when the person would turn their iPhone back on again, this audio that it had recorded from the mic of the smartphone, it would automatically upload that data to his server. And uh, as I say, this is, a, this is a, an exploit. He presented it at actually, I think, several security conferences. And supposedly these vendors of these baseband processors, okay, they've patched security holes over the years and, you know, yada, yada. But... The point is that here was a guy who had, I mean, it was just him, right? He's not like the NSA and the CIA where he has, like, billions of dollars and resources and, you know, manpower out the wazoo. This was just one guy who's kind of a nerd, and he decided to figure this out, and he did it. And this was, like I say, it was like 10 years ago. So, and of course you could say, well, but wouldn't it drain the battery life if it was doing that? And yes, it would, but not very much, because it's not actually... It's not firing up the radios to transmit signals back and forth. It has nothing to do with Wi-Fi. It has nothing to do with GPS or Bluetooth or all the high-powered part, even, even the actual the core application processor in the phone, the main processor. That, that wasn't powered. It didn't need to be. So it would eat a tiny, tiny amount of battery life. And because he had something like 4 megs of RAM to play with, he could record hours of audio, compress it, encrypt it, and when you turn the phone back on, it would send the data up, and sure, it's going to use your data connection, but it's such a small amount of data that you'd never even notice. So, yeah, that's, uh, even with smartphones, um, off is not really off. Uh, in fact, there were, um, there was a report that when all this NSA Snowden stuff came out, like, a couple of years ago, uh, apparently there are some smartphones where the baseband processor is never actually fully off, and it is actually technically possible to turn smart, certain smartphones on and do things with them without actually hacking them. There are actually like gaping security holes in, these, in this baseband processor code that's, that's in, every, in, in phones that allows them to do this with certain phones. Now have these things been patched? Who knows? But the point again is that um, many of these things are very possible, especially if you have vast resources. So. And lastly, uh, smart TVs. Smart TV hacks, you know, oh, the microphone is spying on you, the, you know, the, the camera is, you know, TV appears to be off, but it's like sending video away. That was another thing that uh, I think it was Snowden was talking about, oh, the NSA can do this, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, there was, um, 
I think before those revelations came out, there was a Korean, I think it was in South Korea, Korean University, where these researchers basically took a, a Samsung smart TV, it was Samsung specifically, and they were able to actually do the exact same thing. With, without you know, tons of resources and everything, they were able to take their Samsung smart TV and they, they had the screen off, they had the little red LED on that shows that it's off, and while it was hacked like this, uh, the microphone was recording audio and the camera was recording video and in fact they were live streaming the audio and video uh, to their server so yeah the TV looks like it's off it's not and of course smart TVs in a sense are very much like smartphones these days there's all kinds of stuff they can do but a lot of this code that they run on its security is not really like the primary concern and so a lot of these devices have all these holes in them and uh, manufacturers are extremely slow to patch security holes in things like smart TVs. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much the deal. Uh, off is nowhere near off anymore. It hasn't actually been off for a long time. So for more techie tips, see scottystech.info. Thanks for watching. See you next time.